start recording now. All right. Welcome again. Welcome to this meeting for Global Water Dances. It's very exciting to see you all here. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I see faces that I saw before, and this is very exciting. <laughs> and I see new faces too. Hello, Wendy, Amanda, Sakarola, yes. All right, Kirsten here too, Susan, all right. Yes, yeah, so please, I would like to invite you, if you are new to Global Water Dances, I invite you to write your name on the chat and also where are you right now? Um, yes, connecting from. And <laughs> yes. And if you are not new to Global Water Dances, I invite you also to write your name and also where are you calling from? And your, um, yes, what was the last time that you did Global Water Dances? Or how many times? <laughs> yes. Hi, Ellie. Litra, yes. Excellent. And my, yes, I'm again, my name is Vanya Ibarwen. I'm the artistic director of Global Water Dances, and I'm calling right now from Long Beach, California, in the United States. I'm originally from Peru, and I'm super happy to have you here in this meeting. It's our second meeting from some of you, it will be the first meeting. Um, and we welcome you today. It's a very interesting day because today we're going to be talking about uh, one of the themes of global water dances, and uh, it is the global theme. Um, yes. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Zion Kim. Yay. <laughs> Great. Anna, this is your first time. Yes, yes. Hello, Natasha. Excellent. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit for those who are new to Global Water Dances. Uh, this is an event that started in 2011 um, with the first event and it's um, happening every two years and the idea is to have um, uh, to dance, to raise awareness about water through the language of dance and film. So uh, what we have been doing from the beginning of, uh, from the first Global Water Dances in 2011 um, is contacting choreographers and site leaders to organize their own events uh, near bodies of water and to let people um, also understand and feel why water is important, but also why dance is important for us as dancers, because we know it, we know that it's important. Um, so, um, Yes, this year we know that we have challenges. It's going to be maybe a little different than before, especially for those who already did Global Water Dances before. And uh, as we share in our last newsletter, do not worry. We have a plan, we have opportunities for everybody to participate. It's going to be exciting. We are celebrating 10 years of Global Water Dances. <laughs> so it's a really good reason to actually dance, do, and yes, promote uh, these two very important um, themes, water and dance uh, around the world, right? So um, today exactly we're going to be talking about that and about how we came from 56 sites to 170 in 2019, and we don't know exactly how many sites are going to be this year, but um, it's not only about the numbers, but also about the connections that we have with each other. Uh -huh, yes, and I'm really glad to see, wow, people from different places, Korea, from, yes, Berlin. Oh, wow, this is great. Yes, <laughs> Nova Scotia, Canada, excellent. So yes, yeah, so today we have, a uh, very special guest and um, his name is Matt Reeves. He is uh, a dancer, a director and also a filmmaker. So it's perfect um, for us to have him here because um, what we're going to do for this new Global Water Dances is to shift a little bit. We were always working with film. We were always working with uh, site-specific dance, but for this year, what we are planning is 
actually that we can connect, uh, we can share during the June uh, a week, yeah, it was gonna be a week, not only one day. Yes, uh, we're going to share different videos from each one of you, right? For those who, will, who would like to participate in this way. So from those who would like to participate by sending videos about uh, dance and water, uh, there will be a special day that will be um, starting on, on June, um, well, first, starting on June 8th, we're going to have our, uh, our documentary that it's on the world right now and it's very exciting is the 10 years of global water dances and uh, on the first day we're going to share that it will be really wonderful and also at the same time we're going to do uh, what we call uh, uh, the splash mob dance so we're going to share a one minute dance and everybody will be able to do it from wherever you are from your home from a place and it's going to be everything on social media and then uh, from June 9th, uh, 9, 10, and 11, we have three days where we are going to share videos from you. So the idea is to do a nice program and we're going to present that online. And then we're, have, we're going to have the last two days for um, uh, first on Saturday, June 12th, the idea is that those sites that are able to perform are going to do the global, you know, the regular event because we don't know, a few months later, maybe some sites are going to be able to do it. So we are welcoming those sites to do live streaming. And then on the Sunday, as a closing, we're going to connect like this, everybody, and we're going to perform the third section of the global dance that is already in our website for you to learn. And, um, and also the participatory dance. So for those who are not moving with us, we are going to be live streaming our movement and they can follow the section four. Okay, so that's the whole idea. I know a lot of words, don't worry, it's going to be written. It's already on our website, so you don't need to remember everything. But if you have any questions, just you know, post it in the chat and later after the, our great um, uh, opportunity that we have today webinar, we're going to have the questions and, and answers, okay? So I'm, I know I'm talking a lot. Now I'm going to present our guest of today for the global theme that is about creating community through um, technology and social media. So we have Matt Reeves and I'm going to give, yes, the mic to Matt who was waiting today. <laughs> and thank you so much, Matt, for being here. Thank you, Vanya. Uh, yeah, wow, it, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be with you all today. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of what uh, Global Water Dance is transforming and considering this year. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a gift and a joy to be doing artistic things, talking about artistic projects with all of you uh, in light of the epic world that we live in today. So uh, we, I, I was really inspired talking with um, Vanya that you, this is a great opportunity not to uh, make do with the changes that are in front of us this year, but to make something new. So everything that I, I hope I can share with you today from my experience is about uh, taking what is in front of us and making something really that excites you as an artist with it uh, versus feeling like we're being forced into a container maybe that we're not used to. Um, in case it's helpful, um, Vanya mentioned it a little bit. My, um, I am a co-artistic director of Orange Grove Dance, a dance design and film company. Um, and our mission is to bring dance and di design and film and the uh, unique artistic process that it involves to all the communities that we engage with. Um, and I work, I work collaboratively with my wife and artistic soulmate, Colette Krogel, who um, is not here today, but I'm happy to represent us um, in this sphere. But in case you're curious, I put Orange Grove Dance up there. Uh, feel free to uh, look at our website or reach out if you need to. We're always happy to talk to new people. Um, and, and some of the resources and things that I'll be sharing are things that obviously are from my experience, but if you want to look at any of those resources anymore, they may be on our website or they might be on our Vimeo page. Um, great, and then uh, today, um, maybe I'll see if I can get my screen share happening. Can everybody see this? I need to move that out of the way. Does everybody have a good view of um, this lovely photo that says dance film considerations for the process. Um, 
I'll be talking about uh, dance film, which is something near and dear to my heart and something um, I've been doing inside of our company now uh, since since early on in 2007. Um, and uh, just something I want to put out there that is sort of a, a, a trope uh, for Colette and I, but we, we, we started as a duet company and partnering is something that's so important to us. Uh, that's not just uh, with dancers and with each other, it really became with the technology and uh, film was an extension of what we felt was a greater duet that is happening um, between us as human beings and the technological world that we live in. So um, if I can contextualize any of this, I hope that um, if you're not familiar with this process or if you're coming back to it or if this is something you've done before, something that we always try to emphasize is uh, the camera as a partner, any technology that you're using as a partner and how um, how we pick it up and interact with it in our space uh, should be treated as such, treat it like a dancer and uh, all those beautiful considerations. And that's why I think dance is such a beautiful marriage of the dance film world, of the film world. Uh, it'll be a lot of uh, things that you're used to already doing. And I think a lot of the euphoria and transcendence that comes with dance exists right here inside of this process and inside this world. Um, so uh, I won't be able to cover everything, obviously, in a short period of time, and no one needs to hear me talk forever. Uh, <laughs> but I'm hoping I'm pointing us to a few things. If, if you're not familiar with just um, working with dance through the lens of a camera, um, these are things that uh, I teach at, at different various levels and workshops that I hope can um, frame and contextualize what would be things that you could consider but please know that there'll be many different ways to extrapolate um, on these ideas uh, in the film world they're always talking in three production phases um, there's pre-production production and post-production um, and i i just i i make those words uh less sexy and i say plan shoot <laughs> edit export uh just to you know uh production is great it's a great word and usually there's a lot of big elements that come into it but what ultimately needs to be executed is a planning phase your shooting phase and then there's an editing and exporting phase um and i think it's good no matter where you are in the process this year of what you might make to uh just consider a three-phase process um i think will really help if you can break down your timelines give yourself, whether it's a week, whether it's two weeks, whatever makes sense for you to do each one of these ideas. Um, sometimes they all get mixed in together and things can be done that way. Um, but sometimes it's just a much more satisfying process um, when you've gone from the planning all the way through to the finish line. Um, I'm gonna talk today mostly about uh, the planning phase and the shooting phase um, versus editing and exporting and most of the things I'll talk about won't be uh, the nitty gritty of, of technical information. I'll encourage that um, and and to say I started as a dancer. I'm not formally trained in, in film or technology, but I've just been working in film and media and projection design for a long time. And there's more resources now than when I started. Um, YouTube and the internet answers almost all of <laughs> um, the questions that you may have out there or can get you very, very close um, if there's technical things, although I'm happy to answer anything that you might be curious about later, but just to uh, share what I'm hoping will be processing and conceptual things that may help. Um, so uh, we'll talk about planning and pre-production. Um, I, I really emphasize this as being maybe the, one of the things that will set up a project uh, like many things uh, to be its absolute best. Um, and I, I say this because uh, once you get on, uh, let's say on set, you're in production, you're, you're shooting the camera, any stone that wasn't left um, unturned can, can sort of derail a day of shooting and can um, uh, cannot, it doesn't maximize your time as best that it can. So making careful considerations uh, about how you're gonna shoot something and how you're gonna plan the event uh, will just make your life a lot easier and especially if you um, end up bringing in collaborators or other people that are helping you um, inside of your work this is a way to maximize their time and their efficiency um, so the first thing that uh, i tell especially to dance people this might not be the first thing on everyone's production list but scout a location make a dance <laughs> um, dance on film is inherently site specific um, so uh, considering the space and choreography should come first uh, sometimes uh, 
I notice, especially with a lot of younger students and people that I have that uh, they get very caught up in the equipment <laughs> and what uh, might be very special about that they can do and special effects and editing and big ideas. Uh, but I, I oftentimes have to ask the questions like, what is the dance? What is, you know, going back to what are the essential choreography things that we do already and, and not forgetting it's important to be the artist first and make the technology serve what your artistic vision is. Um, and this is at the heart of what Global Water Dance has been doing for so long, what so many of you have been doing. Uh, I imagine most of your work has been not on concert stages to show water issues, but going out to sites and being near water itself and creating site-specific work that can inspire people um, to look closer at these issues at hand. Um, but an important element not to forget. And then what I think is exciting about this is with film, location may really open up now in a different way since you don't have to transport your whole audience to the location that you might be considering this year. You, you may only need to trans, uh, bring along your camera and equipment. So um, thinking about if this can open up unique possibilities that you may not have explored in years past would be something that I would hope to emphasize here. Um, and this is also, uh, I encourage people to go to these locations. If you're thinking about it, go ahead and pull out any camera that you have, um, whether it's the one you're shooting on or not, and do test shots, make the test dance, really experiment in those places to see if it fits what you're hoping for. And oftentimes those test shots, to me, they're the equivalent of creating your, your storyboard or your script. That might be something that you can reference later that can bring other people that you might want involved in the process or can just help you really dream up how the puzzle pieces will all come together. Um, a few more things about location that I think could be really, really helpful um, for, for anyone and everyone. Um, and especially this year, knowing that many, uh, I, and I work with limited resources all the time. I don't have uh, tons of equipment and I don't have a full movie crew that can come set up lights for me and always make my performers um, look like they're in Hollywood. Uh, but lighting, lighting, lighting can be your best friend. And I, I think there, um, it may be your first and greatest consideration. I, I think there's an advantage if uh, we probably will be shooting a lot of people maybe near bodies of water outdoors. Uh, so using natural ambient light is, is a great, great asset. Um, and one thing that you can get more from that with is uh, in photography and film, there's magic hour, which is your sunrise and sunset times. Um, and these are really particularly effective at getting the most out of any camera or equipment that you have. So it means getting up really early sometimes to take advantage of sunlight um, or catching that last hour of it at the end of the day. But what happens is the sun is just setting and uh, you don't get any harsh shadows anymore or just rising and you get a really even spread of light uh, that is very flattering to most people on camera and it lets uh, your viewer think about things other than the lighting. They're really just falling into um, what you're showing on camera. You get much more even colors and exposures. Um, so it's just a great way to take advantage of what might be, what, what might feel like limited resources. And this is something that uh, Hollywood does as well. So <laughs> very few things beat really great sunlight um, when you find it just right. So when you find that location, considering the time of day that you might be able to shoot there is really important. Um, things that will mitigate this for you in terms of lighting would be finding shady areas like the one pictured here. You can see that the lake behind uh, one of our performers on shoot here, Juliana, um, is a little bit brighter and hotter. We've got a lot, a lot of contrast there, but the area inside is shaded and it has evened out a lot of the tones and light that we we're using shooting that day uh, shade. And then cloudy days actually can be your best friend too. So this may mean if you can be mobile enough or flexible enough with your shoots, uh, sometimes cloudy weather gives you really even light that can be really uh, flattering and can get the most out of uh, cameras and maybe what could be limited resources. Um, but as you're considering your location, really consider what kind of ambient light you could get. And this is another great thing. You can just go test at those times of day that you're considering um, with your camera. Um, second biggest uh, consideration that I would offer up is uh, space to move the camera and set up your shots. Uh, obviously, a lot of things could just be set up on a tripod, um, but if the space is tight, and this may not happen in many outdoor spaces, but it could, uh, if you can get enough distance to really 
cover um, your subject, your dancers, to really get the feel of the environment that you're looking for uh, that could be difficult or not in some places. Uh, and then uh, camera movements, uh, which in a lot of, uh, I, I would say in the dance film genre, camera movement is extra important. It, 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 create, it is that partnering, it is that dance of the camera and the person moving. Um, that really makes a lot of shots dynamic and is different than when we just document a dance like we're used to maybe from back of house in some situations. It's the thing that will draw the viewer in in a really unique way, getting angles, and we'll talk about this a lot, uh, that provide a different sense of intimacy than you would if you were just standing back and documenting something. Uh, so just something to consider is, will I have the space to move around? Will I have the space to set up the camera on different angles and different shots? Does this space offer me flexibility that I might be looking for on my shoot day. Um, and again, test, 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 get out there with anything, your phone and, and just see what's available to you. Take quick 10 second, 30 second shots. Um, danceability and safety, uh, just to call out is something I'm always considering for our performers because that can, uh, for two reasons, no one wants a performer to get injured or hurt because of things that might uh, be problematic in a, in a natural environment, especially, but even if, uh, you know, unfortunately we have to deal with considerations that people don't respect the environment, there's trash, there's things like that can be in any outdoor public space that could be dangerous. Um, just making all those considerations. Uh, one, you want everyone to be safe. Two, if you run into anything and you can fix or correct it, but it might delay your shoot and then you're losing valuable time uh, when the sun is setting or something like that. So just if you can, making a quick list, even if you don't find anything, at least you did that checklist of like, this does feel like a danceable safe space. It doesn't look like my dancers are going to turn their ankles. Um, or if it is bumpy, maybe I need to make sure I get people out here sooner to uh, evaluate and sense the space and figure out what the dance is that is safe here. Um, and then a final consideration, which um, I would actually say this isn't a, a, a huge one, uh, but always something to be aware, access and permission. Um, so uh, whether it's a private space or a public space, just being aware, sometimes it's great if you know someone that has a private space that's just going to let you uh, shoot or be in that place. Uh, public spaces, usually you can shoot, but uh, being aware that sometimes um, some of them do ask for permits. Um, if you're staying mobile and you don't set up a lot of equipment on the ground, uh, most of the time that is allowed, even in places like New York City, where I've shot mobile film crews, uh, as long as you're moving and you're not blocking traffic and um, not something that if someone asks you to move can't be moved, uh, you usually don't need a permit. But if you are considering a really special location or you know it's a public space, it might just be look, worth looking into uh, what what local guidelines might be in place. and. Um, and if there's anything else that you need to consider, and you might might be a way to get great support. Sometimes people want you to do something really unique or interesting in those spaces or to capture it on film. So I don't always think it's a no or like you're, you won't find that permission, but just something to check. So again, you don't get derailed. Um, uh, equipment and resources. And uh, this is in no way comprehensive and they're really huge bullet points, but just to have any kind of checklist to make sure you go through that can save you some time. Um, the camera, <laughs> you will need a camera for this. And um, there, there's so many great uh, consumer options. I don't think anyone needs to go out and buy anything. Most of the cameras on, on iPhones and smartphones and Android phones today are really, really unbelievable, especially if you're taking advantage of the ambient light that might be available um, where you are. Uh, but just clocking that you have a piece of equipment and that you can get familiar with it. Um, and if you want to do more, it yeah, I know this is uh, we're obviously in, in times of, of COVID, and I'll speak a little bit more to my experience with this. Uh, but if you're thinking of any other collaborators, sometimes this isn't something you have to do on your own. You may be able to talk to a photographer or a videographer that you know. If you know a great photography person that hasn't worked in video much, sometimes they're a great person to bring on. Uh, they'll want to collaborate, and they usually have a great eye for light and some of the things that a camera already needs to do. Uh, but just kind of, you'll need the camera and you'll need someone to operate it. <laughs> so even if you're working by yourself, just calling out what that process might be like. I've done it plenty of times where I've had to record myself, but it offers less flexibility in certain ways. Uh, so if you're dancing in it or someone else is dancing in it, just acknowledging who will be that person that 
uh, is is tracking the camera, which is at this, uh, it is your audience's eye. So always having someone with eyes on that. Um, and if you're the person directing it, really, really uh, making choiceful um, decisions with what you do with the camera is is a big deal. Um, a tripod or a steady cam and or both uh, tripods are always worth it. And there's so many different options, even for the uh, smartphones today, you can find other ways to stabilize and set up your phones. Um, but just making uh, clear and deliberate choices of when you want the shot to be still, when you want it to be moving. Uh, there's some really great steady cam options out there for those that are interested in this process and beyond. Uh, there's a company, DJI, that has one for about $120 for smartphones that um, is, is really uh, phenomenal uh, for what you get for your money. Uh, but if that's not something that's in your ballpark, I always encourage people, you don't need any equipment necessarily uh, to start. And I also love dancers uh, becoming cinematographers because moving the camera is, is about moving your body. So many of these shots you can practice and learn how to do without any of this equipment. It's just more taxing <laughs> on your body, but dancers oftentimes are really great at being smooth and flowing and, and place holding where the camera needs to be. Uh, it just takes a little bit of practice to get those shots. So even before you buy equipment, this would be something you might just want to test with whatever camera you have to see what really works for you. Um, then I'll say uh, the crew, <laughs> um, as it would be called on a lot of sets. Uh, but these are just the people that are going to help you. Uh, you don't need to have any certain number and people to define in too many different roles, but you may need people that can help you. And I think this will be the biggest thing for everyone to figure out if you have people within your household that can be these positions, especially during times of a pandemic, and depending on what is um, safe and acceptable in your area. There are advantages that you're shooting outside with people. So uh, working comfortably with a small group of people and masking up, I'm sure is possibilities that some might be able to consider. And then what you're asking people to do, but you may need that camera operator. You might need someone to run sound. It's always great to just have an extra person that might need to run back and forth from the car. That's a do it all person. <laughs> uh, Cause there's just things that you forget or don't encounter. Um, someone that can watch out for you if you're moving in a public area in case other people are, in that space as well. Um, so just finding what a workable number of people are that can help you. Um, and again, a lot can be done if it is a decision to do uh, much of this work on your own, but um, I just encourage you to explore what are my resources? What are, are there people that could help me with some of these things? Um, we mentioned this earlier, light time of day is your maybe one of your greatest resources. So just keep considering that. If, uh, if just ambient light is not the only resource that you have, just consider if you have other lights. Sometimes big work lights that you keep in your garage can be useful um, for lighting a situation or a scene if you have a particular idea in mind, um, but aren't necessary. But it's definitely OK to make a quick list of like what are other resources that I have in terms of light. And this might involve other people on the crew. Um, sound will be a consideration, I think, for everybody in some form, even if you're going to lay the sound on later in, in post-production, but uh, just determining if you need to have a microphone to catch any of the ambient sound that might be happening in the environment. Uh, if that's not important to you, do you need uh, the dancer or dancers to hear music that you have had composed for any uh, reason for this project? So you might need a speaker that you would bring with you on site to make sure that everyone can access and hear effectively what they're doing. Um, and then uh, music, just to consider, since the ultimate goal for this is to be published online, uh, copyright issues are a big thing on, um, on YouTube. <laughs> um, and, and just sharing in general online. Uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing and thinking a lot of people have worked with people or have original music made or make their own music at times, so you won't run into those issues. But just making sure you make those considerations so you don't build something that you really love and then have trouble posting it because uh, they they blocked it because of music reasons. Um, and then finally, I know this is a oh, a lot of uh, larger bullet points, but the the costumes and clothing to consider. And um, I say this just because that's another thing that can uh, maybe derail you if you haven't considered it before going out to shoot that day. Uh, will what everyone is wearing, will it make them pop out of the environment that they're in? Will it allow them to blend in with it are considerations to make? 
And then uh, one unique thing when you're working on camera is really tight patterns. So um, pinstripes and really tight plaids um, and sometimes even really tight polka dots. It depends on the pattern, but they all create a very weird effect on video because of how frame rates work. Uh, and you can always do a fun experiment if you think you have a, a tight pattern, but it, it does a weird optical illusion on your eye and it will just, it jolts people when they see it on camera. They think about that rather than the beautiful dance that you've made. So um, it's always good to test the clothing or the costume ahead of time. Um, usually if they're, you know, solids, you're very safe. And, um, and then maybe even considering if there's logos and other things that might be on, um, it's pretty rare, but sometimes things get, I don't know, flagged as promotional or whatever, if you had the logo of, of the right company on. Um, but it may just be more you don't want that in your video is what my guess would be. Um, I hope we're all doing OK. I know I'm talking a lot. I'm going to keep pushing through. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. And I'm going to uh, hopefully Vanya will help me sort of sort through anything that is uh, dense or uninteresting or not in the right direction for you. And I can come back to it at the end. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're hitting over the halfway point here. Um, I really want to emphasize what you have is great. <laughs> what you have is great. Um, you know, so, uh, so many people will get obsessed with the, the equipment they have or they don't have. Um, and some of the most interesting work that you'll find is people working with limitations. So, um, and, and what limitations can be really great because they hone in your choice making. And so if you're really just working on your phone, uh, know it's enough. Just get to know that really, really well. Find out what it does well for your shots. Um, if you do have the opportunity or if you work in photography and you have some other equipment, then that's great. Bring those things in as it feels ready for you. Um, and I just emphasize over and over, get to know your equipment before the day you go out and shoot. So just test. It's like, it's like an artist doing sketches, right? We, we want to do as many sketches as we can um, before we try to like attempt the big oil painting where we're going to bring in um, the more intense materials that will really uh, have a, a, a certain kind of drying time and curating time. So uh, the more you can prepare yourself for what the event will be by doing these quick sketches with your equipment, which is like your paintbrush, uh, I think the more successful and happier you'll be with the, the product that you'll be able to build. Okay, <laughs> so we sort of did it. That was, a, that was a, a, a super rough and I definitely missed a lot of points, but those were just some points that I think are really instrumental in process uh, oriented versus some of just the granular technical details. Um, I'll go over a few things when you go to shoot that um, some of them may seem overwhelmingly obvious, but I always state them just because uh, I've learned through workshops that not everybody has the, the same vision or access or um, to how the editing process might go and so it can affect choices. Um, and then we'll go through a, a nice shot list that I think is really important just for your, your framing. Um, the number one thing that I, I always have to uh, <laughs> help just a few people with is just making sure that you shoot horizontally. Uh, this is the native language that we're used to seeing cinema through. There's nothing wrong with a vertical shot, but all of our players, all of our TVs, everything in this world has been made into this window frame. So unless you're making a really uh, choiceful reason for shooting vertically, because you know you're going to edit together in a very particular way or or you want that look of it being on a, on a phone in that way, um, you always want to make sure that you rock yourself into the landscape orientation, which this is actually something for even, uh, I, I would say a lot of photographers that are going into video sometimes even forget to sort of reorient themselves because they're so used to be able to in photography shoot in the dynamic orientation that makes the most sense to them. Um, so just check this first. If this is something you're not familiar with or getting used to, always checking your landscape. Um, this will and keeping all your footage the same. So when you edit it in post, um, you won't be having issues. Um, and if you're not familiar, this is a, a concept in film, but not just film. It's really a visual art concept. The rule of thirds is something that um, I just always bring this up as um, a general rule that you can feel free to break, but it's always a good starting place. And I find that when people are working cinematically the first time, it's there's a lot of variables to think about when you set up your shot. Um, but the rule of thirds is a great place to start. And it, rule of thirds, in case you're not familiar with it, says it ha it's this grid that we have on the screen. Um, and these points where the intersects right in the middle, 
They've done a scientific study somehow that says our eyes are drawn to these points whenever we look at a picture, a work of art or video. Our eyes naturally go to these locations and they attribute uh, importance to things that they find in these locations. Um, so just by setting up your shot and you can see our subject here, this, this dancer just on the rule of thirds, it, it creates those two things, our eyes are naturally led there. It also creates a point of interest that's not just uh, central. Obviously putting something in the center will always make it the most important object in your film, but this offers a, a way to balance a couple different things, the, the subject, the dancer, as well as the environment. And I, I always love it when you leave space to one side because that leaves space for our imagination is how I like to think of it, space for what is going to happen in that, uh, in that place. Um, so these are, uh, it's a place to start for everyone if you're just starting off and looking for ways to set up your shots. Um, and I encourage you set it up here. If it looks great, <laughs> shoot it like that. If you set it up here and it's a good way to go, this isn't what I want. <laughs> and other framing is an option. Um, I encourage people to, uh, this is a great time to get to know films that you love. <laughs> Uh, and I, I love to watch other films and, uh, and uh, filmmakers I love and look at their shots because they certainly don't obey the rule of thirds at all times, although it may be something they use. Um, if anyone's familiar with Wes Anderson's work, he, he's always in the center. <laughs> um, but there's many different ways to think about this. And sometimes it's just a really fun. It's like sketching. Oh, I, I saw this idea that uh, a filmmaker I really did, uh, really love did. Uh, I wonder if I can recreate that shot. It's a great way to learn about what you like, what you don't like and what is possible for you. Um, and it can inspire your storyboarding, inspire a lot of things for you. Uh, but worst case scenario, if you don't know where to go, rule of thirds is a great place to start uh, tuning your instincts. Um, okay, this is the, uh, the final, um, the final <laughs> list that I'm hoping to share with everyone today. I call it framing a uh, cinematic term. I, for those of us that may or may not have worked in film before, moving the proscenium. So if you're familiar with working in a proscenium stage or how that might work, we've always, there's oftentimes a frame <laughs> in the context of how we've been working now, instead of that frame being here and the performers having to just move inside of it with cinema, we're moving the frame. Um, and then uh, a big thing that I, I like to emphasize is levels of intimacy that film offers. So um, as we go through these shots, uh, thinking of it as different levels of intimacy every time we bring the camera closer or further away. And this is something unique that we can do with film that isn't always a possibility in let's say a live performance. Maybe it is, audience can sometimes move forward and back, but film is uniquely set up that we oftentimes jump through these different frames to get different levels of intimacy. Um, the first shot that I'll talk about that we see all the time in cinema is a, is a wide or an ultra wide shot. You can differentiate these uh, a little bit, but I kind of group them together just as a way of thinking about them. And they're used, this will be really useful, I think for global water dances. Uh, we're establishing time, place and mood distance. These are the concepts that we're establishing beyond just uh, the character or dancers in the space. We're establishing context of where we are. Um, and so uh, these can go really, really wide. You can really experiment with how much of the landscape you might be able to bring in. Uh, that would be your ultra wide. And like in this one, I don't even see my subject unless my subject is the birds. Uh, here's a different example where we do have dancers and performers inside of the landscape, but you can really see how far away we are. And there's a huge emphasis on the environment, on the on the trees and the skyline. There's just uh, so many other things that are offered that aren't just featuring the performers, but contextualizing them. Uh, I showed this shot. This shot's uh, a little bit in between, but I, I still consider this a wide personally. Some people might disagree, but I the focus is on the landscape for me here. I'm seeing the horizon line and the sky um, and it's really setting up environmental factors. Um, just a few other examples of what this could look like or one more here. Um, of a, this was a, a shot we did in Rauma, Finland uh, many years ago, but um, we're obviously contextualizing this space with the windmill um, again, skyline, and we go well beyond any individual one performer as being the subject, the, the group of performers is the subject, and it's important because it's placing them in context 
to the environment. So this is, and we're thinking of this as intimacy. So this is one level of intimacy, less intimate with the performers, maybe more intimate with the environment and the context that we're, we're setting up. So if you're looking for that, that's when you wanna think about your wide shots and your establishing shots. How can I paint this picture? Um, the next shot that I talk about is a, a full shot. Um, and this is always very useful in dance. Um, it's going to get the full body as its primary focus and concern. Uh, it's not at, it's not concerned with the environment. It's concerned with getting the full body of uh, your subject. Um, so head to toe coverage, and uh, this is oftentimes great to shoot uh, as. Uh, people often shoot this as coverage. We see it actually less in cinema, but they shoot it just in case they've missed something. You're going to get head to toe coverage of everything that happened. Um, the intimacy level has come in a little bit. Uh, we're still going to get different environmental factors, but we're, we're, we're starting to make the subject pop out a little bit more than just the environment. Uh, a few examples here of what that could look like. And you can see the range, you know, um, and, and again, these categories kind of butt up against each other. There's probably more of a Venn diagram of how each shot works, but the choice that you're making of what you're prioritizing, am I prioritizing the dancer and the subject in this shot and getting full coverage of their movements? Am I prioritizing the environment? Um, and even just between these two shots, we've come in a little bit, we've become a little more intimate with the dancer, the dancer at hand. Um, the, the next shot that I think is really, this is probably my favorite shot and we shoot a lot um, when we work on a dance film is a medium shot, uh, also known as a cowboy shot. And it was actually developed from old Western movies because it was so important to show when a cowboy walked into the saloon, the guns at their hips on their holsters, you had to see that and you had to see their hat. Um, and for whatever reason, this shot became a really dynamic shot that uh, was not just used in Westerns. It developed in Westerns and became a shot used uh, universally. And it, again, creates a very different level of intimacy. We come in usually at eye level with our subject or character. I think it's a really dynamic shot and dance because um, one, we just, we get closer. I can still see a lot of movement. Granted, we're losing um, a little bit from the hips and below, but it's not a shot that you see all the time when you go to watch something live in your mind's eye when you're watching live dance. It creates a different, this is where we really start to create a level of intimacy with dance that isn't always there in a live situation. We're getting that much closer to the dancer. Um, so we are losing a few things, but um, important things here. And, and you know, you've got plus or minus on a few inches. Don't worry about locking it in uh, to any perfect. I can show a couple other examples here, but just reminding yourself, I'm getting from the hips to the top of the hat. I'm getting that full head. I'm getting head coverage and a little bit more in the hips. And, um, and it gives you at least a, a place to start working from um, if you're looking for that that layer of intimacy with the dance at hand. Um, and you can see here, even with these shots, you know, we're, we're still capturing very different environments. We get a lot of the environment as well. Um, they're not limited in their intimacy, but the performer and the environment feel more balanced here in terms of their effect on the audience and the viewer. Just a few more examples. This one's obviously cropped in a little bit more, but for me, it's in that cowboy shot range. Um, and then last but not least, we'll talk about uh, close up and extreme close ups. And um, this is tightly framing a character object. And we're, now we're talking about uh, this level of intimacy, I think will convey the most emotion and symbolism oftentimes within a cinematic journey that you can take your audience on. So um, using these shots really choicefully, they're very, very impactful. And this is when we start to get into the, the head of the, the performers and the emotional content that they might be experiencing. Uh, you can see in this shot, I think this is like a classic, it's like, it's like the statue, it's a bust, right? It's from the shoulders to the top of the head is, is a classic uh, close-up shot, but there's, there's room for variation in top of, inside of that, but this is a, a place that you could start. So uh, this would be a close-up. This would be somewhere in the range of uh, an, almost an extreme close-up, but we're just cropping the chin um, and we're just cropping the top of the forehead. If you get too low to the eyebrows, it can sometimes feel weird, but when you just crop the top of the head, it actually puts us as a, as a viewer into the cerebral space of the dancer or the person performing. 
um, this becomes, uh, yeah, cerebral space that we're sharing together. We're, we're leaning in, we're that much closer to the head of the person that we're observing. Um, and so if you're looking for that, if you're looking to expose those little moments, uh, and again, moments of intimacy uh, that, you're, that you're sharing with your audience of, of the experience of what it feels like to be in this environment, um, these are the shots that will contribute the most to this. Uh, here's a, a very extreme close up. You can go as close as the eyes. Uh, some of this will depend on your cameras and focal length. So it's good to get to know your camera and what's available. Um, and maybe it's not always the person. These are just a few other examples. Uh, this is a, obviously a book in space, but if you're shooting outdoors, it could be a great shot of the leaves or a branch or something in the water are other things that you can use. And now we're doing intimacy with the environment, not just intimacy with the performers. So um, all of these shots can be applied in different ways. Just a few more examples to show when it's not just dance and whether things can have uh, symbolic or metaphorical meanings when we bring in close up and don't always explain the image, but create provocative images and how tight we get to those. Um, doesn't always have to be faces reminding ourselves in dance, um, the hands, uh, the feet <laughs> going through uh, the space is really, really vibrant and important. And again, again, even though the wide shot can contextualize the environment, the close up can do it as well. Uh, we could imagine if this hand was in the water or if it was uh, this hand that was reaching into the mud, um, these would convey really important things, not just about the dancer, but about the environment. So these shots aren't limited in terms of what their applicability is, um, but they're just general rules of places that you can start from and see if they lend themselves to the context of your dance and the hopefully the greater vision that you have overall. Um, awesome. That's my that's my spiel. Um, I hope we've left some time uh, for questions. If everyone has them, let me stop sharing so I can see more people. Um, great. Thank you, Matt. This is great. <laughs> we have some questions here. Uh, I'm going to go through them. So I think some of them were answered while you were um, telling us about the process, but one of them is what color costumes work well on film? That was Molly. <laughs> Uh, great question. I uh, I don't think there's a, a necessarily a limited range on your colors. Every camera does pick up color a little bit differently. Um, what we see live is not always what the camera will pick up. So uh, I would just encourage doing a test to, to make sure. I, I think the biggest thing is always patterns. Um, and again, patterns might not just be visible pattern like corduroy or um, some fabrics that have very tight uh, knits to them can do strange things and sometimes they don't at all. So again, I, I encourage you if there's something you're imagining artistically, just test it. You, uh, and this happens in, um, in all of the film industry anyway, they do a test if there's an idea. Because um, even if they thought it was fine, it might not be so. Um, but uh, I, I would say think about things that uh, allow you to see your subject in the environment might be the most important choice with color. Um, so if you blend in too much, sometimes those are things that you can't do in the, the editing process if your colors are too similar. So if you really want to see the dancer in the environment, um, thinking about opposite colors may be helpful um, or brighter colors that pull your dancer out. But, um, but, but go experiment. I, I wouldn't say you have to limit yourself with color. That's great. Yes, I was thinking also about, you know, what the concept of that uh, particular uh, you know, video will be like revealing or blending. I think that's what you were saying too. Like, it depends on your environment. If you want to reveal, you know, you want maybe to have something that is kind of matching what is in the background. So uh, I think- yeah. right. I can offer up to uh, someone who's done a lot of site-specific dance uh, on film and just enjoy. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I get really dirty. <laughs> <laughs> dirt is just, like, I don't know, I'm always dancing on the ground and in the mud and maybe you're going to get wet. Uh, just knowing that that process will happen to your costume. Uh, I always lean towards costumes that sometimes look dirty to begin with. I always like it not to look like new clothes is my personal artistic choice. Mm -hmm. um, 
I like there to be a history or an element to things like that. But even if you were to wear something really bright, uh, knowing that once you shoot it, if it does get dirty, uh, continuity with trying to shoot it again will be something that you might have to evaluate. And uh, if you can, and resources are limited, sometimes having a spare costume is never a bad idea. <laughs> Clothes rip, uh, you know, get caught on something, just get so wet. Um, I, I rehearsed in really cold, wet environment, snow lately, and we just had to make sure we had other things on hand. And I think that'll go under a little bit of the safety check. Co you can see how costumes and safety are a bit related there, but if you go through some of those checklists, um, it can be a great way to one, save you time when you get to that moment on when you're shooting. Ah, I planned for this. You know, I know how my costume's going to go. It's going to get dirty and I'm okay with that, or I've got a spare. And those would be just some other things that might be worth considering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. We have another question here uh, from Claudia, Claudia or Claudia. How many cameras do you recommend to use for one performance or dance film? Uh, hmm. It really, uh, it really depends on the, uh, on what you're trying to capture. Um, I would just, I would caution people, more cameras is not necessarily uh, more. <laughs> it's not always better. Um, if there's a specific shot, it can be helpful, but um, I would just really think about your layers of intimacy. If you can plan your shots ahead of time and think about what you really want to happen, one camera is often what you need. Um, sometimes we want to shoot with more cameras because we want to get coverage in case we mess up or something like that. Um, but I, and that that's fine. That's good. But more often than not, I don't always prioritize that second camera because it was a safe shot. It wasn't the shot I really wanted mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I try to encourage people to get, get the shot you want. Um, and if that's not working, just know it's okay. Maybe we need to reshoot or recalibrate use the same camera and shoot it a different way. Um, but if you do have multiple cameras, they it, not to say it's not a resource, you can set those up and, and you can get different angles at the same time and that can help you edit things together. Um, but I think it's really dependent on uh, the situation and then uh, dependent on your resources. If, if it's gonna be really taxing on you to set up two to three cameras and you don't have time to work with the dancer or dancers or focus on the artistic process, I would say that that's not as worth it as, you know, setting up one camera, focusing your time and attention on that and, and then keep moving it around. Um, if that's helpful at all, it's always situation dependent. <laughs> Is that good, Claudia? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So um, we have another question from Sabrina. Do you think it's possible to shoot at night? If so, what do you recommend? Uh, yes, it is possible to shoot at night. Um, it, it really depends on the location. And I would say you would have to really evaluate lighting and know I, you're probably going to need some additional lighting. Um, and you're going to get a very different feel. If, if we show this video, um, that we, it's a, it's a shoot that I did with, uh, my company, uh, recently in the fall here, um, we have a night shot in it that I can, <laughs> Once you see it, I can reflect to you a little bit of maybe what was happening in that shot. Um, but uh, I would say it's gonna it's gonna be a difficult uh, venture, most likely uh, without. You may need a higher level camera than your phone. Uh, mm -hmm. The the DSLR cameras that are available now, if people have those, and mirrorless cameras, uh, which are somewhere in between the Hollywood cameras and what we have as uh, consumer grade, those have the potential to bring in enough light to capture things in dark light situations, but uh, that's definitely a step up if it's not something you've done previously. If you've already worked with a DSLR camera, um, that might be something that that's possible for you. And then you just need to figure out a few lighting resources. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a couple more questions. Um, it's, could you please repeat the information on DJI equipment? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, and I can actually, I'll make sure to Vanya, I was maybe going to put in here, but I'll find a link as well to the actual uh, product, although they are always updating it. So sometimes I, I give you one and it's like the, not the newest version, but um, DJI is the, is the company. 
Um, and for those that are interested, they, they're, they're the same company that makes uh, a lot of the consumer grade, but, but better in drones. So a lot of really beautiful drone photography that you see uh, these days is DJI is that same company. And um, they're really, they're, it's, it's a phenomenal, we're at a really interesting technology phase. It's a huge jump. Like when we went to uh, just HD camera technology from VHS and we actually became digital, but now uh, the, the gimbal stabilization that is available inside of drones is the same stabilization that you get inside of their little handheld unit. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll make sure I get a link to Vanya that can be dispersed um, in case you're interested in that. Um, and it's designed for smartphones. Um, there's, there is a tiny bit and you can watch any, there's a million YouTube videos on it. You have to balance your phone in the uh, device, uh, which isn't terribly hard. It takes again, a little bit of practice, but you probably knock it out in a half hour, um, but you balance it so that it gets you nice and smooth shots. And another nice thing about it is I, uh, the new ones now have a little legs that flip out. You can set it up as a tripod on something if you need to, or you can pick it up and use it as a moving shot. And um, if that's something, and again, they're about $120 right now. And some of the older models might even be cheaper these days. Um, it, it's, it's a nice piece of technology that can really, I think it's important for dance if you wanna have a way to move in and out of your shots. Um, you don't need movement for movement's sake, but if you're, you're really looking to counter what's happening inside of the, the, the dance that you've created, it can be a really great accessory or tool. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. So yes, I will. I will send you the information to all of you uh, after this. And um, there's another question: If you have a friendly, you have a budget-friendly suggestions for how to protect waterproof equipment from filming in the water. That is a great, great question. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I wish I could show you the camera. So uh, some of the GoPros and some of the similar to GoPro cameras, you don't always have to get a GoPro. Those uh, come with oftentimes a water protective case, uh, something you can use. And that might be a great accessory that you could bring. They're typically wide angle lenses. So they get a lot just to know the difference with those and what you might get on your camera. And that can be really spectacular, but it's something to test. Um, I know with iPhones now, they're at least, and that if you're not, isn't like mine and I've cracked the glass or something, I don't test it underwater very often, but many of them actually are waterproof, I believe. Look this up, don't take my word for it on your individual uh, phone model up to a certain depth. So uh, if you're adventurous enough to put your phone in the water, some of them are made for that now. Uh, that won't help uh, Android users that I know, but some of the Androids do things that I don't know about as well. And it used to be you could buy the phone cases that would actually do that. So those would be two avenues I would go down first. Uh, your more expensive higher end. I actually don't know many people who do that with their expensive cameras because you can't afford to put them under <laughs> <laughs> underwater unless you're doing that uh, professionally. Um, but phones and GoPros, I think, are the route if you're looking into that uh, would be the first place I would start. Um, either your phone might be able to do it, you might be able to get a case for your phone, that would be the cheapest. And if not, GoPro, and GoPro is not the only company just to call out, there are uh, a lot of other brands out there that may do what you need. GoPro is just the best named one right now. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, yeah. Thanks, Carolyn, that was a really good question. I'm, I'm wondering too. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, and then there's another question about the proper credits at top at the end of the film. Um, I think you mentioned that it's important. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, a question, hold on. Yeah, did yeah. you mention the importance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, well, it is super important to credit everyone that helps you. <laughs> on your journey. I think um, uh, our production process often looks very different in the dance world than it does just in the film world where you have to credit people. Um, knowing who's working with you, what titles they're comfortable with ahead of time might help um, allay concerns. There's big titles like director of photography, director, mm -hmm. and um, at the end of the day, a lot of that is is uh, is the semantics of, of what people want to be called. And some people may really, that might be important because they work in the film industry um, and that's how they're recognized. So just knowing if that's how someone is previously recognized is important. If not, I, I, I think most of the time, whatever we usually do in our, in our credits for uh, programs and shows that we've done in the past is really valuable of how you credit 
your dancers and performers and whether or not they've collaborated with you, but there's not a, um, there's no, there's no one way to do it. Make sure you give yourself credit if you directed it and choreographed it. Um, in the film world, people don't recognize that sometimes the choreographer did all the work. Um, they only recognize if a director did something, um, which seems silly to have to differentiate, but it, it is helpful if you end up using this for other projects. Uh, people will recognize that you directed and choreographed the work. Sometimes those two titles are helpful to go hand in hand. Um, and then there is, uh, you can look this up online as I would use it just as a, a recommendation if I need you, I can put a resource to it. But in film, they have an order of like who gets credited first. Usually, I would say this is not true in all films, but you know, usually you're going to see a director's name first, then you'll then you'll see the the cast and then you'll see uh, music and composers. But uh, I think everyone here should honor the collaboration process that they normally do and how much you uh, equate everyone's, you know, um, help and assistance on set. Um, and if it's a small recommendation, but I would recommend always putting your credits at the end now, um, mm -hmm. at least to start, you know, if you hate that idea, I understand, but um, and e it, it could even be your title. This is not universally true, but um, short attention spans with people, but also in great films, sometimes just jump us into it. And at the end, let people read. But sometimes if we kind of delay with the, the reading process before yeah. kind of diving in, uh, I find it does that. It just kind of delays engagement a little bit. So feel that out for yourself. Sometimes credits are really beautiful. I love credits. I wish I could just make credits at the beginning and ends of films, especially when they're done really cinematically. Um, but for short films, especially, and if they are ever, maybe if you want to send this off to a short uh, film festival at some point, uh, they're they're often looking for not brevity because they want your film to be short, but because they might be trying to program many things at the same time. So keeping your credits uh, short and then um, and then towards the end sometimes is just a nice way to make sure that people get into your film um, mm -hmm. right away. Don't don't give them a chance to go somewhere else. Um, is is something I might recommend. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also we are going to uh, give you some uh, guidelines. I think that's something that is coming up after this. Uh, so it's you know like you you you, you will have like a what is it called, like a template uh, that you can follow. So it's easier for you to just fill out the spaces and add if you want to add more credits is something that you can add too. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, I think there's a last question here. Is there an editing app that you recommend? Um, I, I recommend again, the editing app that you have. I've worked in everything from, I started an iMovie cause it was the free software that was made available on Macs when they were truly made for creatives. And I went through Final Cut Pro and I work in Adobe Premiere now. I like the Premiere suite. If you have access to Adobe um, software, I, I think that's a great option. I know many people in educational institutions often have access to that software. So that's free for you. Um, it'll be a, I, and I really mean this, a slightly steeper learning curve than something I think like iMovie. I think uh, it's just about getting in there and getting familiar with the software you have at hand, letting yourself practice. Um, at the end of the day, they all drag and drop files into a timeline. You cut mm -hmm. them up <laughs> and put them <laughs> together like a puzzle. And then there's some other um, nice bells and whistles in there, but that's the editing process for all of them. And iMovie and if there's a Windows movie, like they all, they, that's what they do. They, they edit those things together. Um, if you can have something on a computer, I recommend that. They do offer some on uh, your tablets and your phones as well. People can edit things together in that way. There's always a possibility. Obviously, if you can edit on a computer, I just think the screen is bigger. You're more comfortable. And usually you have to drag and drop things in um, precarious ways. So uh, that can be beneficial if you're considering what might be a best option for you. Um, and sorry, th th that makes me think uh, something that's not mentioned. This is the technical stuff. Uh, have a, uh, depending on what you're shooting on, if you're shooting 1080 footage, which is uh, really nice footage for all monitors and screens and televisions, and most of your phones will shoot that. Um, and some of them shoot 4K now, which is e probably excessive for what you need, really, really large and will be huge files. Um, but file size. So if you record enough film, you're going to need somewhere to store it. Uh, checking if your computer has space 
for storage. Uh, these things can get into uh, tens and twenties and thirties and more gigabytes very, very quickly. Um, so also figuring out what that is, you can do your tests to see how big your files are coming out and having an extra hard drive on hand is something that you may want to do. Um, and I always do on set, I have two hard drives. You can buy cheap ones, but I put all my files on one. I move those files onto the other and I try not to have them travel together. I learned this from um, film crews in New York. This is so if something ever happens to the hard drive with all your footage on it, <laughs> you have a backup somewhere uh, because inevitably computers crash and things happen like that. So, um, and if you do it right away, right when you get the footage, you just back it up twice. Sometimes that's a good way to give yourself coverage so you don't lose your really hard work on a great shoot. Um, I think it, it, it's unlikely to happen, but just if you're if you're one of those people like me that likes to be extra safe, um, it's something you could look into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And remember also, you can go as Matt was saying, I mean, there are different ways to, um, to create this video, right? You can go for, um, you know, something very simple and just having one a smartphone or a camera, uh, or you know have actually a collaboration with um with other professionals you know that are doing that work so you don't have to do everything so don't say that now you need to be a filmmaker <laughs> right but if you want to do it if you want to have somebody you know who can help you or you can do it you know it's 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 accessible see what's saying too yes yes so um let's see uh what can we do in order to describe the con yes this is sara right sakarula hi from greece what can we do in order to describe the continuity of the process especially if we do a performance in three kilometers area do you want to to tell us a little bit about that um. yes, hi everyone <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Zaharula from Greece, and it's the third time for me, third time that I'm organizing, choreographing also the Global World Dusties in Greece. And uh, the last time I tried to make um, um, a performance uh, at the same time uh, in five different places. Um, and uh, uh, I, had the, I had the problem um, uh, in capture, capturing the images, but uh, the, the most difficult one is to show that there was a continuance, that from the one place to the other, there was something happening. Mm. So the area was three kilometers uh, till the final dance, and uh, there were so many people walking by, and um, we lost the, the idea, the scenario. We just mm -hmm. had uh, five different things uh, that they didn't have um, following up. Mm -mm -mm. I see. I don't know if you understand me. I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. That that's, good, a, yeah. that's a really unique challenge. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you're still trying to do it uh, live or recorded, are you, are you, are you open to the uh, film process? I try to do it live uh, with the help of the videographer, um, but there was a problem because we we put cameras in five places, but we have um, we didn't we have lack of um, of crew, and uh, it was public. We have to be careful for the equipment not to be taken. Um, so we try to put only two, and we, whenever uh, the first um, performance ended, we took them to the next one. But the range was so big that we didn't have time, so we lost some time there. Uh, and because of the people walking by, that there were many, we couldn't um, uh, find the dancers easily between the world. So there, there, there wasn't like we decided, uh, like we think that it's gonna be in the first. <laughs> so I'm trying to understand how could I do some something like that without uh, very big cost. If there is a way, I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, I, I will, I'll say, I think you're taking on a really difficult challenge, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, I think that's a, it, I guess it depends on the expectations of what the output will be. And if you want to keep it live, if you do it live, um, I think there might be ways to stream live from phones if you have service and things out there and that's gonna, it, it'll limit you a little bit, but maybe you could have one person in each location streaming from a phone to somewhere else. Uh, that's a whole nother can of worms if you still wanna do it live a little bit different than what we spoke about today. Uh, but film might be a really unique opportunity where if you can shoot over multiple days at those locations, so start at one location, really dedicate all your time that day to just getting the footage there, then the next location, the next day, the next location, the next day, the next location, the next day. Uh, I think you'll have a really exciting uh, job. It, the editing process will be where you try to take us on that journey mm -hmm. of all those places together. Um, but if there's any way to allocate your resources to a single location at a time and maybe not feeling like you have to get it all done in one day uh, would be my recommendation for something of this scope. Uh, it, it sounds like a very big undertaking that you have um, there. Yeah, the, the reason that we did that uh, was because we wanted um, for the people that were passing by to see the process uh, and not wait for a performance and leave it. So there were many performances with different themes and there were children that taking part at the same time in different places. So uh, they, they didn't just waiting for someone to perform without knowing what, what is going on, what's happening there, what are they doing. We wanted them to engage in the, mm. so that was the problem. Totally, and I, I think and that brings Oh, sorry. I, I think that brings up something we didn't talk about today, but all of the cinematic techniques for the most part that I talked about today were, um, so there's documentary style of, of film work, you know, that maybe this is something closer at home, depending on your projects. I'm not sure if that's right for this one or not, but just to emphasize the difference, you could still frame your subjects and, and use a lot of the shots that we talked about, but the emphasis of, of documenting something that did happen live is different than recording something uh, just for film that we know the audience will see later so it's somewhere in between um and i would just uh, evaluate what the priority is uh for you what what's most important that is that liveness factor really important and we want people to see the documentation of that later on or mm -hmm. is the concept something that we can shift and change and say we're going to record this independently and the audience will have to will have to wait for what we revealed to them um big dilemma <laughs> yes yeah I, I, I hear that. I think I think that's a great consideration for everybody too about what's at the heart of this for you. I, I, uh, liveness does not have to be given up completely, um, even on on film. Obviously, we watch a lot of film that feels really live, even though it's recorded. And a documentary style work that is exposing things in a very particular way and has a voice to the audience that goes beyond, say, an abstracted dance piece is something that you might be interested in, and especially with uh, global water issues that you might be talking about or addressing. So um, obviously film is just such a big thing to cover in such a short amount of time. Uh, many of the things we talked about today will apply to that, but if that's a process you're thinking about, it, it's a little different um, and worthy, worthy of looking into. And I would recommend looking at other documentaries if that's something you're interested in too. Um, the, the, the trick might be the time frame, but there's plenty of them that are great and small. Um, and shorter films that you, you could look at. So that was a great question. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I think it's important um, to also understand that um, whatever we are showing on those three days, it's something that you need to send before the performance. So you, you will need, we are going to have a deadline of, you know, like, uh, like a month in advance or a week in advance, two weeks in advance. So it's not happening on June 12th. So whatever happens in June 12th is something that if you are able to, you know, uh, you can do it like, like and live streaming that you can have, if you have, you know, on June, uh, you can have actually a performance outside with audience or not. That's something that you can decide later on. But all of this is a preparation and we want to, um, not do not doing a post production of a video, but actually doing before, so we can present that video uh, during the week of global water dances. I just wanted to make sure that that's 
something that everybody understands that it's um so you have if you know if you have the opportunity now or in in a couple of months maybe to shoot outside that's something that will be great and you can manage that at your own timing and uh you know that that's that's the the beauty of this work that you can actually you know you are, you don't need to commit with a specific date uh and the only com commitment is that um, if you would like to be part of this kind of film festival that we are organizing, that you can send your video before the uh, deadline so we can organize them and put them on a nice, uh, yes, program. Okay, but yes, you are free to do, you know, if you want to do again, uh, and if you are able to, what you did uh, in 2019, that was wonderful, you know, to have all those cities, almost like the One River Mississippi that uh, Merrily did, uh, before 2011 that she was, you know, having um, performances along the different places uh, and many other examples in, in New York also, you know, um, um, that will be wonderful. We don't know if that will be possible. Um, so that's why we're given these opportunities. I just wanted to add that. Yes, yes, Molly, the filming before the event is a very exciting opportunity. Yeah, I know. And uh, Cynthia also was saying that she she they have sex doing film performance separate from the live performance. So that's that's something to take into account. Thank you, Cynthia, for your comment. All right. So um, I would like, I don't know you, but I would like to move <laughs> a little. I would like also to see Matt. I don't know if you have time. Uh, I would like to also, um, you know, uh, yeah, let Matt show in a video um, that that he made. Um, but I, I I feel like, yeah, yes, I feel like. Do you want to actually see what is the new global dance? <laughs> yes. So um, I just wanted to let you know, everybody, that um, for the new people too who are joining us uh, this year. We usually used to have four sections for every global dance event. So the first two sections are um, just the creativity of each choreographer, the ritual that is the opening part is the first one. The second one is the local dance, talking about the water issues in your own location, or just you know talking about what is why water is important in your own place. And the third part and the fourth part are the global parts, let's say that like it's like, uh, you know, like everybody's doing something very similar and is what actually uh, bring us together as a, a group of uh, artists and um, activists. So, um, so the global part, the part three, we uh, change it a little for this year. We're going to do uh, only five minutes instead of the nine minutes that we were before. And uh, we have that already on our website. We did this as a, um, we call it a virtual movement choir, meaning that each one of us can be in your own place and we are going to dance it together. But also if you are able to actually do it on the day of the, you know, June 12th, you're going to do it live, you can easily translate this into a group. So um, I invite you and everybody to just stand up <laughs> and, or you can also, you know, do it uh, on your own place if you want. But I'm going to stand up. And um, yes. I, and yes, let's kind of, I mean, this dance is very gentle. So it's not like we're going to, you know, the lifting. You can also, of course, because it's, uh, you have kind of a guideline and that's also, um, the rhythm motif is already on the website. So you have guidelines, but you can take this dance and modify it depending on your own style of dance or also what is your approach to uh, having your dancers doing it. So uh, this story uh, starts with the feeling of dehydration, dehydration. <laughs> yes, deshydratación, meaning that we are very kind of Yes, uh, feeling the lack of water, okay? And you can start wherever you want. You can start in low level, middle level, high level. That's free for you to do it. I, uh, for the video, I started facing backwards, but you can start in different positions. The same for your dancers. They can start different or together. That's free for you. And this feeling of really feeling really, yes, like you need water. You're like, 
Yes, completely. Uh, yes, your energy is down. You're very kind of bound. And, uh, and then suddenly you are going to kind of move. You're trying to reach. Where's the water? But you don't have energy. Okay, so it's, that's, that's your feeling. And then you're going to feel like uh, the water itself is coming down finally. Yes, and you're going to feel that drop in your body. And then after that, you do the cup hand uh, motif. Yes, that is receiving that water drop in your hand. And then after receiving it, you are like, oh, obviously you want to drink it, <laughs> right? Yes, and then you receive another one and you receive another one, yes. And you're feeling like you need to really drink and take it all of that inside of you because you are a body of water, yeah. You take it and then this movement is going to be each time a little bit more kind of faster and you can take the space with that kind of motif, yes. And bringing all that water with you, you are now full of water. You are so happy because you are have life again. <laughs> and then you bring that water with you. If you're in a group, this will be like everybody together. But if you're alone, you just come in here and we're going to share that water. So here in front of me, if you have also your camera, you can turn it on. If you are dancing without your camera, it will be wonderful. Let's share that water. Look at this water. Imagine that it's water. So the water is going to kind of move and go from one side to the other. That's wonderful. Yes, and make your body also kind of go to one side to the other. Go back a little bit. So to take this, that was a really nice example of, a, of what's it called, the shot? Yeah, a close up, right? And then we're going to go around with that. Yes, paddle of water. And we're going to do it now, we're classical. Whoa, river. So at your own time, and go to one side, the side, one side. Yes, and also we don't do it this at the same time. If I'm doing it, then you can do it, and you can do it, and everybody's kind of doing it, going a nice stream. There we go. <laughs> yes, we do this only twice, but you can decide if you really want to do maybe more times. This is like a river stream going around. And then this is going to give you, yes, kind of the impulse to, Turn around, yeah, there we go. Now we're going to do a figure eight movement four times. One, two, three, with your whole body, four, center, up, down, and then going around. Yes, now we're going to repeat that, but now this time we're going to move around, okay? So just feel the movement of your body. One, two, three, four, center, up, and again, move around. It could be a jump. And now you can, the third time, you can take this to your whole room. You can go away. It doesn't matter if you're not in the camera. One, two, three, four, center, up, around. Ah. <laughs> nice. From here, yes, this river, this was a river, it's going to convert now into waves into the ocean. So what we're going to do is we're going to go sideways first. We're going to crash into each other on this kind of Zoom windows, okay? So we're going to go, choose one side, whatever side, and you're going to go back and forth, going down and up, and down and back. Oh, we're crashing into each other, that's nice. And again, hold it up. And going back. This time we're going to go front. Yes, let's go together and apart. Yes, here we go. Up. Woo. And back. You can decide if you want to jump. I'm just going up. Up. And going back. Woo. Yes. And now the last time we're going to come together, we're going to do the circle of unity in between us. So just do a lunge. Open your arms. Yes, like holding hands. There we go, find some nice angle here. <laughs> and now lean back, oh. Yes, we're all together here, ah. Oh. And we're going to kind of celebrate. Let's put the bar, arms together, hands together, reach each other. And then take all that energy and then is the moment to celebrate. This is a big celebration, huh? Yes, and you can do, yeah. 
your own rhythm, timing, whoa, your own celebration. <laughs> yes, I know we're without music, but that's the idea. And then from here, how wonderful, Natasha. I love it. I love it. <laughs> from here, we go into the unison part. Okay, so the unison part is a little bit more difficult. I'm just going to do the last part. That's something that you can see in the back of you so you can follow. I'm going to do just the last part. We're going to do it only once. So we are going to take the hands, our hands and cup going up. Yes, good. And then I'm going to be, I'm going to face this way. Then I'm going to go with the thunder down. Yes. Then I'm going to go up, reach to the sky. Then I'm going to take that drop again and going back. Preparation for the waves. I'm going to go front and back. Go up and then back. Then I'm going to go up towards the mountain and then I'm going to go down and around. Big circle, reach again and reach again. And then there's a carry of water. I'm going to do this movement with my hand in front of me. Down, down, and then we're going to do three splashes. So we go one, and two, and three, and up, and rain coming down. <laughs> awesome, that's repeated three times, okay? Woohoo, then to end, yay, we did it. <laughs> to end, we're going to do our Classical also participatory dance, all right? So let's do it together. We go, the water is going to go up. Yes, the rain is coming down. Then splash your face or nurture your body and then the waves go out and around the world. Let's do four times. And water goes up and the rain comes down and splash yourself. And then share the waves. Third time, and water goes up, and the rain comes down. Uh, yes, and the splash your face. Drink your water and goes out. Last time, and water goes up. Really reach up, and the rain comes down, and splash yourself, and the waves go out to the whole world, expanding. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for sharing with us the movement. <laughs> All right. Ah, well, that was a little, a little something I tried to, yes, be concise and giving you some of the patterns, but you're going to see that with music on our website. And next time we're going to do it with music, hopefully. So try to rehearse a little bit. <laughs> so for the next month, you can actually, you know, just follow the music and do it with us. All right, will be exciting. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much, Matt. I would like to see. Sorry, I mute myself. <laughs> if you would like to share the video, a little snippet, I think you have a really nice example of you were saying, it could be the whole video too. I think with the people who is here, it's just, it's just a short film. Sure, yeah. Um, I, the reason I think this might be nice to uh, share, this was a project that was meant to be uh, built for a live installation, but that didn't happen uh, due to events at the Kennedy Center not being able to happen live. So it got reformatted and I had to work with a small crew, it was just four of us that uh, shot this uh, film on location in upstate New York um, last, I think November, but I can't, the world is, a, uh, the time is a blur to me, but um, but I, I just say that to contextualize, it was, it was a small group of us. Uh, we had to uh, work through our own uh, quarantine restrictions and work with masks and everything to create this together. And it was done in a natural environment in upstate New York. So I think a lot of those things will just be similar to the, the process that many of you might be going through this round. Um, and I'm excited to share it with you. Uh, let me see if I can.
if you're on mute, are you are we going to be able to listen? I'm just wondering. Great call. Are you showing the video right now? I am. Are you not seeing it, Vanya? No, I just see the video on pause. Oh, okay. <laughs> let me stop and try again. Um, yeah, there are multiple ways to share in Zoom. It's kind of interesting now. <laughs> are you seeing my mouse now? Yes. Okay, let me see if this works. Yes.
let it roll for a second in case people were curious about the credits, but <laughs> um, this is how ours look um, for a small project. That was really gorgeous. I'm so inspired. Thank you. Um, and for those of you that are curious, oh. <laughs> Sorry. I was just gonna mention that, um, so that the shot you saw at the beginning was with a DJI drone. <laughs> In case those of you that are curious about that company again, uh, it was our first time I, I got one for our company this year. It's new technology for us that we were looking to test out on a video shoot. So uh, just say that, you know, we had a curiosity and, and wanted to explore that. That's where some of that came from. But it's the same company that makes the steady cam that I mentioned uh, beforehand. Um, and that opens up obviously some very different possibilities, but is not necessary. And many of the shots you saw, uh, they were done on a, a, a nicer camera, but many of them could have been done. We, we used daylight to our advantage um, and could have been done on phones and things like that. And our, our uh, director of photography, Jonathan, did do shots on a gimbal. He also did a lot of handheld different shots with Juliana, our dancer at times to capture the movement. Um, just to emphasize things that you know and things that can be useful to you um, and that were at hand and, and what we talked about today were all relevant and just making this uh, small project. So um, I'm grateful that I had time to, to share that with you. And if you have any future questions or considerations, you can always reach out to uh, Vanya who can relay information to me. And if not, um, I work at orangegrovedance.com um, and uh, we have an email on there and a contact form as well. If, if you have a, a question directly, uh, please feel free. I apologize if I'm sometimes the worst at email. <laughs> I, uh, I get backlogged and then catch up to you sometimes a week later, but uh, I will always try to answer questions uh, as best I can. Vanya's great because Vanya can always give me the nudge. Hey, Matt, <laughs> did you see this? So. Um, yeah, thank you for letting me share today. It was really an honor and a privilege to, to speak with everyone. Thank you so much, Matt, for being here today. Uh, I, I have a one question here. What is the split screen mirroring technique called? I think it's mirroring. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, um, yeah, it, it was, you, you recognize it's a, it's a mirroring technique um, and uh, it's uh, very, I, I, simple is misleading, but it, it oftentimes is duplicating a video and butting up the seams just right. And depending on how you do that can um, evoke a really different image than if it's always right down the center. Um, so there's some choice making in that. And if it's a moving shot or a static shot, it does very different things. But um, I don't know if any of you have, have seen the um, TV show Dark. I recommend it. It's a German TV show, but cinematically they do some really interesting things. and their opening credits, which I always love great opening credits. It's an opening Rorschach image. It does this effect very, very successfully. Even if you don't watch the show, the um, the opening credits are <laughs> maybe worth it to watch, but they use this mirroring technique. Um, and it, yeah, I, I it, you know, it's really nice. Um, we, we had it in mind for this project before we shot it. It was something that we knew we wanted to do to take advantage of some of the natural beauty of the shots. Um, and uh, if it's something you're interested in, that's something you can play with in the editor. Um, but I, I always go back to what's the artistic choice, you know, make sure whatever editing choices and things you do still fit into uh, what you were setting out to do artistically. It, those will be the things that get backed up the best and will make your project feel cohesive. Um, there's a ton of bells and whistles and things you can do, but always trying to make sure they're serving your greater vision um, and know that you don't need those. Sometimes just getting a great shot without mirroring it is totally all you need um, and usually it's better. Sometimes when there's editing tricks, it's because we're trying to cover up <laughs> something we weren't so certain about. So um, when you don't have to use them, that, that speaks volumes. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. And thank you everybody for being here today or tonight, depending where you at right now. Uh, it's really, really great to see you and to, you know, interact. <laughs> yes, thank you. So if you have any questions, you know, like maybe, uh, you know, you're deciding after this uh, conversation, just feel free to email me. Um, you know, Natasha is also offering uh, another workshop to, uh, well, 
tonight, no, tomorrow for you. Yes, <laughs> I love this what the time sounds. Uh, and so if, if, if maybe you know somebody who missed it, I mean, if the time is okay for them to join, please do it. It will be a really interesting. Another group of choreographers too that you may want to meet. And um, I'm going to be sending also, um, yes, this uh, to everybody who maybe missed it and hope to see you next time. If it's not, you know, uh, with Natasha next month, we're going to have our water theme. Uh, it's going to be really, really great. And Natasha is the one who is going to be live with our guests. And um, I'm going to be also here um, then with a the replay. So thank you so much from uh, both the Global Water Dances Project and LIMS, the Laban Bartonieff Institute of Movement Studies. And thank you, Matt, Orange Group Dance, for being here today. And yes, can't wait to see your videos, but yes, still a lot more to come to, to, to talk about. So feel free to reach out, okay? All right, bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.